Well, good morning, everyone. Okay, we went through this yesterday. Good morning, everyone. There we go. It's, Ken, I got them warmed up for you for, for tomorrow, so, uh, but it'll be a tougher crowd by the, the third morning. So uh, welcome back. Hopefully everyone had a great uh, first day yesterday. Uh, I know as I was listening to some of the presentations and uh, had a chance to go and see some of the speakers at the, the Cracker Barrel, there was kind of an, an interesting contrast for me yesterday. So as I was listening to some of the really innovative programs and projects and activities that were being showcased during the Cracker Barrel, I mean, of course, the ideal wheel gets turning. And you, know, you kind of think, well, this is what, there's stuff here we could do, we could take back to our communities and do. And then it, I got thinking about a couple of statements that were made earlier in the morning. One, when I, I was sitting in the, uh, the sustainable community session, and someone asked one of the presenters, Deanna, I think it was, about the pictographs that they were using, and was there an element that people found harder than others to do? And her response was really interesting to me, because she was talking about the, perhaps the more difficult of the things was letting go and moving on. And then you tie that to what Tom had to say yesterday morning about the rocks in the backpack and how we keep adding and we keep adding and we keep adding. And I actually believe that in the voluntary sector, we, we, do, we want to do so much for so many that we have a tendency to keep adding to our own plates. So my invitation for you today is while you think about some of the amazing information, some of the amazing ideas, some of the amazing activities that you'll run across, also be mindful of what you can let go of, what rock you can take out of the backpack so that you have the time, energy, and resources to make some of those truly come to fruition and do them well. Because I sometimes think that stopping doing things is a greater challenge than adding new things. So with that mildly insightful overview of yesterday, um, a, a couple of things. So before I uh, invite Max up to, uh, to, to talk about his keynote presentation, um, two things. One is, um, you'll notice in the back corner there are a couple of whiteboards that have got sticky notes on. And so you're invited as delegates to put your thoughts on a sticky note. Um, there's two statements there. One is, I'm inspired to, dash, 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 or dot, 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 I guess. And the other is, I have learned. And if there's things that strike you, that the moments that were inspiring to you or an insight that you gleaned, take a moment, jot it down, and, and put it up there. Because again, we'll be looking for what the impact of this, this gathering has been. So one of the things that we talked about yesterday in terms of why we're here uh, there was a, a myriad of things, but one of those things was to share stories. And we heard last night from Jamie and her compelling story of how the impact of a mentor has, has profoundly changed her life. And uh, I'm delighted to introduce a short video of another person who has agreed to share their story, and that's called Jacob's Story. Dad and I shared a pretty special uh, relationship. My dad taught me how to do endless amounts of things to fix, and from fixing cars to building uh, cabinets and all that kind of stuff. So I was a happy kid, normal childhood, um, until about age 11 and my world was turned totally upside down. I knew something had gone drastically sideways. Uh, she looks directly at me and says, your father has passed on. He did suffer some, from some medical complications, so I did have some understanding of what had happened, but at uh, age 11, no understanding is good enough. <laughs> After that, I was, I was really confused. I felt that this was rather harsh. I didn't understand what was going on, and I felt that I needed something to really pick me up or get me out of this downward spiral that I was that I was in. So a couple months after that, uh, I was really lucky when my mom had made uh, a call to Big Brothers Big Sisters um, and I met my mentor John and things got a lot better from there. A big brother is not a replacement father by any means. It's more of a friend, someone to who's had the experience to to give advice of what you're facing and really just have have an open ear towards you. Through my high school years, the relationship definitely improved. It every year it got better and better. Um, 
Um, we had the chance to do some really interesting things throughout my high school career, um, including uh, Henry Burris's uh, All-Star Weekend and being part of that. As well, we did regular activities like go to the go for a workout, go grab a Tim Hortons coffee, or. Uh, run out and go see a movie once in a while. It was, or we really like skiing as well. Um, and it was just those things and spending even a Saturday afternoon, if once every two, three weeks was an amazing experience and really helped out. So. What we'll do is we'll refine that <laughs> and bring it back a little bit later. We'll find another spot in the program because I think you'll agree you want to hear the end of that story. So um, it's my pleasure now to introduce the, the, uh, the keynote speaker for this morning. So Max Valakat is one of Canada's best known cultural and media experts and commentators. A marketer by trade, he was the president of Youthography, a Canadian youth marketing agency where he has gained much renown. He's now employed by the advertising agency Ben Simon or Ben Simon Byrne, as a managing director of strategy. I mean, interesting couple of little facts, as opposed to going into his whole list of accomplishments. Is he enjoys sketch comedy. He's actually performed at the Second City in Toronto. He's a former Central Canadian debating champion. Um, he bor was born in Ottawa, studied at the University of Ottawa, where, where he earned a, a Bachelor of Arts degree. And in 2005, he was named one of Marketing Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in Canadian Communications. Uh, this is actually kind of, kind of coming full circle for me. I've had a chance to see Max present a couple of times, and in fact, the very first time I was supposed to introduce him. <laughs> and I, was, I live in Hamilton and was driving to Toronto, and what was supposed to be a 40-minute journey turned out about two and a half hours. And uh, even though I'd left early, I missed the beginning of the presentation, so never got a chance to. So he's going to be talking today about millennials. And uh, for those of you who maybe are a little bit behind or a little bit resistant to the pace of change in this country, uh, you won't be after you hear Max's presentation. He's a dynamic speaker. You are in for an absolute treat. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Max Valakat. Well, now I have to not suck. Um, that's going to be a thing. So hi, everybody. First of all, thanks very much for having me here. Um, my name is Max. Uh, I landed just in Calgary yesterday and then uh, came up to Banff. It was fun to land in Calgary last night and living in Toronto because all I can think of is, oh, right, cities with progressive mayors who <laughs> don't, uh, don't smoke crack. <laughs> really enjoying it now. That's our sort of benchmark for how successful is your mayor. Is he smoking crack or not? <laughs> so, fun times in Toronto right now. I think we're about to get a reputation as Canada's greatest party city, which will be a new thing for us. <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you very much for, for having me here. It's, it's, uh, it's always lovely to be here. Um, you know, uh, I don't know how, I love the fact that there are conferences in, uh, in Banff. I don't understand how anybody gets anything done because I'm like, oh, mountains. <laughs> it's nice. All right. Um, so as was mentioned, my job right now is that I'm the uh, managing director of strategy at an ad agency called Ben Simon Byrne. We are Canada's largest independent advertising agency. We make the ads for Scotiabank and for President's Choice. About 12 years ago, we made an ad called My Name is Joe and I am Canadian that some of you are probably familiar with. So um, that's what we do. Um, my job has always been to be what's called a strategic planner, meaning that I help my clients understand who their customers are in a way to help them solve their problems. And I focus primarily on the youth market, uh, partially because uh, I'm extremely immature and partially because uh, it's an awful lot of fun. And I'm hoping to distill all that information today into about an hour and 15 minutes worth of understanding youth. Um, I'll take questions if you have them as we go along. Feel free to put your hands up or throw something at my head. But I will remind you that we have, um, there's a breakout session that I'll be doing immediately after with a more extended Q&A. So if you're a part of that session, you can hold your questions till then. I should also just mention, as you can tell on the screen, um, that I bear a slight resemblance to Fred Savage. So uh, I just like to get that out of out of the way. Okay. Um, so you've heard a little bit about me and my agency, and now we're going to talk um, a lot about millennials, or about this particular group of millennials. Um, all right, here we go. So I'm going to break this really into four different areas today that I want to talk about. We're going to start by providing some context 
And um, context in this case is mostly demographics and psychographics. I find that nothing wakes people up in the morning for a keynote presentation like a boatload of statistics. So that'll be really awesome. <laughs> We're then going to cover a piece on social media called Meet a We. I'm then going to talk about youth culture in transition, and we'll talk a little bit about trends going on with young people and why that matters. Um, the real thing that I want to just sort of bring up today that I think is important before we start is that uh, you're hearing an awful lot about millennials or young people, and I see a lot of young people in this room. I also know that some of the people who you will be mentoring are also in that age range. We're going to cover a very broad definition of youth and what young people are, but also really explore how they're driving an awful lot of trends that many of us should be thinking about. Uh, th as they sort of cross uh, every single age group. So I'm hoping everyone in this room will find something that's super relevant to them. But um, again, ask questions if, uh, if you need them. So we're going to start with demographics and psychographics. That's where I like to always begin. And the most important thing to know about young Canadians is this. This is what I call the 5 by 5 factor. And that is to say that the very broadest definition of youth, so I have that at 10 to 34 years old, I mean a really broad definition, divides very neatly for the first time into five equal five-year cohorts. 10 to 14, 15 to 19, 20 to 24, 25 to 29, and 30 to 34 are all roughly the same percentage of the population. That's never happened before. 20 years ago, that 20 to 29-year-old age group, which I was a part of, is overrepresented. They're called Generation X, and they drove every trend. Movies, music, fashion, it's all you heard about. Twelve years ago, that tween group that now represents only 6% of the population was 9% of the population across all of North America. There was a weird demographic hiccup where 9% of people in the entire continent were tweens. So they drove every trend. It's why Britney Spears and NSYNC and Backstreet Boys were all inflicted on us at exactly the same time. <laughs> There is now not one subgroup of young people with the numbers to drive trends. And I believe it's one of the key reasons why this broader generation behaves much more cohesively than ever before. A couple more things to talk about that, but let's cover a couple more quick statistics as well. This generation has a different relationship with home and family than ever before. 83% of families with kids at home have only one or two children living at home. That's the fewest number of kids living at home that we've ever had in this country. I think it's one of the reasons why the job that you do is becoming more and more important with every passing year. Our family structure is fundamentally changing, and we're actually having less time to spend with our families, meaning mentoring matters more and more. And I think it's, as a concept, is touching more and more young people in different family structures. In fact, 42% of Canadian families aren't traditional families anymore. They're not nuclear families. They are common law families. Blended families, that's two divorced families coming together a la Brady Bunch. That's good, I'm making a youth culture presentation and the first TV show I mentioned is like 40 <laughs> years old. It's great. In about 30 minutes when I bring up gun smoke, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> um, but the big rising group is single parent families. We're now something like uh, over one in six Canadian families are single parent families, and that number is jumping higher than any other age group, uh, sorry, than any other family structure. Interestingly enough, there's two counties in the United States, the District Columbia and Bronx County, New York, where the dominant family form, the most common family, is a female headed single parent, lone parent family. So the trend is moving in one particular direction, and that is this changing family structure. As well, more women work outside the home, and more who do work outside the home full time. Three quarters of all women in Canada do both of those things now. Which means even your young person in that quote unquote typical traditional family structure has less time to spend with their families. Canadian families report having an hour less time to spend together every week than they did versus just 10 years ago which is actually a huge drop in a short period of time. It led a young person in a focus group I was doing once to say, 3.30 to 5.30 is my chill time. He said, it's my time for me alone at home. I had this vision that after a tough day in grade 10, he's like shaking up a martini or something and <laughs> opening the paper. All that being said, they're staying home longer. 44% of 20 to 29 year olds still live in the family home. Hands up if you have kids who are living at home. Kids in this age range who are living at home? Hands up if you are in this age range and living at home. <laughs> if my mom would take me back, I would go in a heartbeat, but she won't. I just want to take a second to stop on this slide and mention something as we kind of pull all of this together. 
We're talking about young people that have fewer kids their own age to hang out with in their own home, less time to spend with their families and maybe less involvement with their parents, but are also staying home longer. There is no surprise to me that this is the generation that invented social media. You've got fewer people your own age to hang out with in your own house, you've got more time in your own house, and you have probably more disposable income and more access to technology because you're staying home longer. That is a recipe for developing some kind of piece of tech that lets you network with all of your friends. We'll talk a lot more about that, but it's important just to hold. Okay, so these are some big demographic numbers. I want to talk a little bit about psychographics as well. What's going on um, inside the head of a young person. And these are probably the most important things you can learn. It's that our young people, our young Canadians, are partially, not fully, but partially entering adulthood at an earlier age than ever before. We educate our kids when they're very young now. We get them baby Einstein books and CDs, and we panic if they can't read and write by the time they're five years old. We begin tutoring and extracurriculars at an earlier age because we tell our elementary school children that we're concerned about how well they're doing and what it's going to mean for the schools they can get into and the jobs they can eventually get. We're actually getting into puberty at an earlier age than ever before. We're going to talk about this in just one more slide. It's going to be really awkward, but we are going to get through it together. There's good evidence to suggest that we are losing our virginity at an earlier age. The general thought is that 25 years ago it was somewhere around 18, now it's somewhere around 17. This one's very hard to track because you ask young people in national surveys, are you a virgin? And some lie and say they are when they aren't, others lie and say they aren't when they are. Um, I'm looking forward to it myself. Uh, <laughs> I've heard good things. Um, and lastly, uh, we have what I call the grade 9 career choice. So on average now, we live to be 81 in this country. And yet, at the age of 14, when you hit high school, you're told that the decisions you make around the courses you take are going to have an impact on what you can do with the rest of your life. These are some very adult things really happening at an earlier age than ever before. As well, this notion of precocious puberty. And I'm just going to read this. It's a quote from Nexus Magazine, a science journal. While I always believe that little girls go through puberty at around 11, 12, or 13 years of age, something very strange was now happening to our daughters. I was now being told that little girls are considered, quote, normal if they start menstruating at the delicate age of eight. Maybe a bit of an overstatement, but here's some things that we do know. 50%, that's 5-0% of Caucasian girls in the United States show breast budding or breast development by the age of 10. In the African-American community, it's even higher. It's 50% show it somewhere around the age of 9. There was a massive study in the States called The Falling Age of Puberty in U.S. Girls, which was about the falling age of puberty in U.S. girls. And it's a doctor who had a theory that one of the reasons we're seeing a greater onset of breast cancer is that we're seeing an earlier onset of menstruation. And so she wanted to go about proving this. And she thinks quite conclusively that in the past century or so, the average age of menstruation, of first menstruation, has probably dropped by three or four years. She can prove conclusively in the past 25 years, it's dropped by a year. So literally growing up faster. There's an art another article I read just about this in the Toronto Star yesterday that talked about how we're seeing this in pretty much all westernized developed nations. If you're wondering why, I've read everything from... Uh, estrogen in the products that we use, to hormones in the food that we eat. Fundamentally, they think it's something they're calling overnutrition. If I can be really indelicate or undiplomatic right now, we are a larger population. We are a fatter population than has ever existed. We have more going through our systems at an earlier age than ever before. And it seems to be literally fooling our bodies into thinking they are farther along than they actually are and jump-starting puberty. So when we talk about our kids growing up faster, they are quite literally growing up more quickly than ever before. Partially. Because the full transition to adulthood actually happens at a later age than ever before. Uh, these numbers are all versus 25 years ago on the left and now on the right. They're all national and they're all according to StatsCan. The median age of post-secondary graduation was 23. <coughs> it's now 25. The median age of marriage Sorry, the median age of first marriage <laughs> was 25, it's now 28. And the median age at which we had our first kid was 26, it's now 29. In a very short quarter of a century, we've added two, three, or four years onto what's typically considered to be the real milestones of becoming an adult, getting married and having kids. So it all leads to what I would call 
a prolonged pre-adult life stage. Some adult roles and responsibilities at an earlier age than ever before, but the full transition to adulthood actually happens at a later age than ever before. This is the single most important thing I can tell you about this group of young people, and it has implications on everything that you do. Whoops, that's a weird slide. Sorry. Um, sorry, guys. In case any of you want to find out about banking, here's a little <laughs> bit about that. You're richer than you think. Okay. <laughs> Um, there's one other thing I do want to talk about as well, because uh, we're focusing a lot on this generation, which people are calling Generation Y, but there's actually a new generation that we need to talk about, and that's the generation right around the corner, which is a generation that I think is incredibly important to know because they have more influence on their parents than any previous generation. This new generation, Generation Z, so that's people who were born after 1995 or 1996, who many of you may be dealing with on a regular basis, the very youngest uh, group I'm going to be talking about. On the left-hand side is a screen cap from season one of The Real Housewives of Orange County. Anyone watching any of these Real Housewives TV shows and comfortable admitting it in front of a group of your peers? <laughs> That's when the sheepish hand goes, it's like, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so depending on how good your eyes are or uh, how far back you are, you may not be able to see who are the moms and who are the daughters because they're all styled exactly the same. On the right-hand side is a picture from an article about exactly this in New York Magazine talking about the influence of young people on adults and adults on young people, where entire families look like they've bought their clothes at the exact same place. <laughs> that place is, I'm fairly certain, a store in Brooklyn based on that. So one of the things I'm seeing as a marketer is that we used to talk about fun for the whole family, but we don't anymore. We actually push brands that are about cool for the whole family. Letting young people determine what is interesting, what is cool, what is different, and pushing that out through the family environment. Some marketers are already doing some interesting things with this. Sprint, about six years ago, seven years ago, uh, did some research into the burgeoning smartphone market. And they wondered why they weren't able to sell these things into families. And so they did some research with families, and they actually found that kids really wanted smartphones, dads really wanted smartphones, but moms were vetoing family smartphone purchases. And so they developed something called the Family Locator app. And here's how it worked. You bought smartphones in a bundle of four, one for mom, one for dad, one for buddy and sis. And the kids' phones had GPSs that could never be turned off. I talked to a friend of mine at the time who was a mom, and she said, that is completely nefarious, and I want it. <laughs> Which I think sums up most marketing now that I actually think about it. But using technology to literally connect parents and kids this is a way that we're all doing this now. Anyone in the room played video game either with video games either with their kids or with their parents? Hands up, please. Anyone have some kind of a console system at home where you do that? I mean, that's exactly what I mean. When I was younger, there was no way my dad was going to follow me to an arcade to play video games. In fact, middle-aged men who hung out in arcades were kind of creepy. <laughs> I think if one approached you, you were supposed to yell stranger danger and run off or something. <laughs> but now, we actually connect to each other through this technology, and it's often driven by young people. My dad joined Facebook because my sister had a couple of kids, and he wanted to see pictures of his grandkids. And she said, you know, Dad, I can send these to you. Or, like, you know, 95% of everyone I know, you can just join Facebook where there are 500 photo albums for each of your granddaughters, each with, you know, 10 sub-albums in them. There are millions of pictures. Just do that. And so he joined. Now, he joined initially to look at these photos, but he stuck around. You know, his network of people is 28 people, and he goes to Facebook sort of once a week and then scarily gets off of it, but nonetheless, he's there. He started using the technology to connect to someone younger, and he's still going to be around. So couple of implications for here. Number one is I often think of Generation X, which is my own generation, as being a kind of non-generation, which is to say that we behave very much like millennials or like boomers, and I often recommend that people focus on those two, and you'll get this generation to begin with in the middle. I'd also like to point out that your youngest mentors and oldest mentees will have more in common than ever before, and in fact, the age range around which have, uh, people have tons in common will keep growing and growing and growing. And I would say that's probably the number one trend to look out for. 
Remember, this is there's a change in your children as parents are also turning to their kids or to kids in general for social cues, for technology, even for fashion and culture. So it's a generation with a lot more influence than ever before as well. And so when we talk about that group of adults and this group of young people and what's different, remember that this generation still reflects what I would consider to be the big existing youth values. And for me, these are the five massive youth values. Relationships, communication, information, diversity, and empowerment. And you'll notice I have M in the middle for that, which stands for millennials and also stands for media and technology. And I'm going to explain that in just one second. So, because technology should be up there as a value, but it, it's going to enable all of these and fuel all of them. Let's talk a little bit about these values. Relationships, I've talked about how critical that is. Remember, fewer people your own age to hang out with at home automatically, naturally turns into a focus on friends outside the home. This is a generation that values their relationships. Your typical teenage Canadian has a couple hundred Facebook friends. Now, these all aren't like their best friends. I'm not suggesting that. But I would like to point out that for most of us, when we were growing up, we didn't have a network of a couple hundred people. In fact, for generations even before mine, the idea of a teenager knowing a couple hundred people was crazy. You were essentially limited to your class and then maybe some other people at your school or outside your school. This is a group that have grown up learning to connect to large numbers of people and manage those relationships. Therefore, communication becomes incredibly important. Well over 90% of Canadian teenagers report having regular access to a cell phone. I mean, I work in youth marketing, and that still blows my mind. Because for me, it was about having a phone in my room. You all remember a phone in your room? Seems practically Amish now, doesn't it, a phone in your room? <laughs> Like, it's now a device on your person 24 hours a day that lets you talk, text, chat, surf. But that's actually not the most important element of this communication. Having that phone matters, and it's certainly been transformative in how young people deal with themselves and deal with each other. But it's the fact that it's networked. It's the fact that this is a generation for whom it's just as easy to communicate to everyone they know as it is to communicate to just one person. When I was growing up, if I missed a day of school, I couldn't possibly replicate the dozens or even hundreds of interactions I'd had with everyone in my network over the course of a day. You could make some phone calls and talk to people and find out what was up, but you couldn't reproduce everything. Well, now, if you want everyone to know how you're doing, you just update your Facebook status. You tweet about it. Sending a text message to 10 people really doesn't take any more time than sending a text message to just one person. This is a generation who are used to one-to-many communication, and they work with that incredibly well. I put information up there as a value because if you are 28 and younger, for all intents and purposes, you've never known a world without a free, constant, global source of information at your fingertips in the internet. I talk a lot about relationships and communication, but I actually think the way this generation approaches information might be the single biggest difference between young people and adults ever. So my generation, and I'm guessing you know, sort of two-thirds of the people in this room, grew up at a time when information was finite. We thought that there was a limited amount of information and that we could organize it. That's how we grew up. That's what the card catalog was all about. Y'all remember the card catalog? <laughs> An adorable collection of wooden drawers with papers inside. When you wanted a book, you would go to the card catalog, and then you would write down that 35-digit Dewey Decimal number. You'd wander around the stacks until you found your book. If you were like me, you also took the book, the three to the left of it and the three to the right, because it was the day before your assignment was due, and you had to get stuff done. When those library doors closed, we were literally cut off from knowledge. We did not have a way to access information, unless, of course, your parents had a really old set of encyclopedias at home. That was always fun, wasn't it? You're like, in the end of World War II, Russia is now a dominant superpower. I'm like, yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, but we thought that that's how knowledge and information worked. It was finite and we controlled it. That's actually how the Dewey Decimal System was developed. Thomas Dewey was an amazing guy, but he was also a man of his times. So he believed that all information could be categorized into 10 categories by 10 categories by 10 categories. That was it. If you're ever looking for books on psychoanalysis, you won't find them in the medicine section because they'd actually filled in the 10 by 10 by 10 before modern psychotherapy was invented thinking, we understand all of medicine. This is the only categories we're ever going to need. So I believe you find psychotherapy under religious studies in the Dewey Decimal System. 
because we thought we could organize all this information. Millennials and younger have grown up in an entirely different world where information is infinite and you can't organize it yourself, so you need the technology to do it. Y'all use email for work? Just hands up. Microsoft Outlook, anyone? Um, Mac Mail? Sure, so you have folders running down the left-hand side. You have that big folder list. And you have subfolders in your subfolders. And it now takes me 30 minutes. And I need a map to find where I've put anything. <laughs> so Google's email service, Gmail, doesn't let you make folders. You can label stuff if you really want to, and you can. But the truth is, the software can find and retrieve anything you want faster than you yourself can organize it, if you just leave it in a big virtual pile. That is an enormous change. Because, again, we encountered email at a time when you were getting just a few messages a day. Gmail was developed for people who get hundreds of messages a day and recognize that it will organize things faster than you yourself can. Google's email service actually now has a new algorithm that's a part of it where it prioritizes mail. In your mailbox, it puts a line, and the software thinks when a message comes in, is this important to you or not? And if it is, it puts it above the line. Been using it for six months. It has never been wrong. It somehow knows to put messages from my father below that. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I mean, Gmail's uh, amazing. Google's amazing, really, when you think about it. Y'all have used Google Maps or Google Earth? What was the first thing you looked at on Google Maps or Google Earth? Your own house, right? <laughs> I just love that, because it's like billions of dollars in search engine and satellite technology. And the first thing we all look at, we could have just Great Wall of China, who cares? <laughs> Eiffel Tower, whatevs, it's my roof. <laughs> but imagine growing up in that world where all of that information is out there constantly and therefore you cannot possibly hope to manage and organize it yourself and therefore the software has to do it for you. I was doing a focus group not too long ago with a bunch of young people talking about music. And I'm a big music fan and um, when I was uh, in university, uh, I had a huge collection of, of CDs. CDs were small metal discs that we will explain later. Um, but uh, so I had a huge collection of CDs, but I also had three roommates. So once or twice a year, I would have to kind of find everything and realphabetize my 500 CD collection. I'm, I'm explaining this story to this kid, 16, and he looks at me and he goes, dude, why didn't you just click on sort by artist? <laughs> All the music he had ever, I was going to say bought, acquired. <laughs> had happened online, and for this guy, alphabetizing 8,000 songs meant clicking on a column header. For me, it meant two hours of work. It's really critical to understand how information is essentially of value to young people, not just information, but the relentless access to it and the technology that organizes it for you. It has a fundamental impact on how they operate in virtually every way. Two other values here. I've got diversity and empowerment. I won't spend a huge amount of time talking about these, except to say that we are probably the most diverse country in the world. And it doesn't matter where you are in Canada, even if you're in an incredibly homogeneous place, if you're in the straight up whitest, smallest town we have, your typical young Canadian has access to more diverse culture than any previous group if they want it. Now, this doesn't mean that everything is all-inclusive and it's sunshine and puppy dogs and rainbows wherever we go, but it does mean that you see that diversity in action in a lot of ways. Nothing is more important to me than music and food, for instance. So we have a relatively small um, African-Canadian population, somewhere around 3 to 4%. We don't tend to make really great hip-hop, Drake notwithstanding. And yet, the number one form of music for young Canadians, and, and which has been for 20 years now, is R&B and rap and hip-hop. Because you have access to that culture, and you feel like you can connect to it. Food is a great example. Go to your typical mall food court, and what 20 years ago would have been burgers, fries, pizza, and chicken, now has a sushi place, and a Chinese place, and a vegetarian place, and a vegan place, and uh, 15 Starbuckses. It's been an interesting change just to see those things happen, and I think that's an indication of the way that there are elements of diversity that are filtering through everything we do. It is obviously not a perfectly inclusive society that we live in, but I think this generation expects a kind of cultural diversity to be a part of their lives. And lastly, I've got empowerment up there because all of this is enabled by technology. All of this is fueled by media. You may have heard a narrative in the press about young people being very entitled. It is um, often that we hear adults talk about how entitled this generation of young people is. I always find that kind of funny because, you know, 
our kids are what we make them, right? So um, there is something about continually asking a young person for their opinion or uh, trying to find out what they think is cool or, I don't know, giving them medals for participation that ends up turning into a kind of sense of entitlement. But I actually think that's what it is on the extreme. I think it's more a young person who's empowered and not entitled. I actually think we have a generation of young people, not all of them, but the majority, who recognize that they're able to connect to their world on their terms and how they want to at an earlier age than ever before. I actually think one of the issues you guys might be dealing with is the gap between those kids who can do that and can't do that feels very, very pronounced sometimes, which is, again, one of the other reasons I think mentoring has become more and more important. All right, all that being said, we've talked about technology, we've talked about media, and let's get to a quote from a guy named Jerron Lear who is a technocultural theorist. He said, we already knew that kids learned computer technology more easily than adults. What we're seeing now is that they don't even need to be taught. It's as if children were waiting all these centuries for someone to invent their native language. I love that quote. I wish I'd written that quote. And it's a good time to talk about how this generation of young people has actually taken all of these values, wrapped them in technology and in media, and used them to fuel and create these new youthful collectives that we're calling social networks. And I want to talk about this in a section that I call Me to We, where I actually think the development of social media and the development of social networks is actually an indication of a kind of empowerment of young people and something that they've put together themselves. I want to take a couple steps back before I do that. So I started hearing a lot of quotes from young people about six, seven years ago, things like, my friends are my family and I can't live without my cell phone. I heard from parents, why do they spend so much time texting? Why is my daughter on Facebook all the time? Or the big one, don't they care what is out there being written about them? That's a huge one. And it made me realize that we've moved from a world of me and we've moved into a world of we, a world of connected young people using social media to live very much in the now, in the present, and in their own world. And an author named Emily Nussbaum in uh, New York Magazine wrote a great article about this, and she said that the difference between how young people and adults express themselves online represents the biggest generation gap since rock and roll. I believe her. So I want to take a couple of steps back. For boomers and Generation Xers, that's the generation before mine and my generation, it was the age of me. And the age of me was always the age of next. There was a fairly short period of time between being an, adult, an adolescent and being an adult. It was a, actually a very short period of time, sometimes just a couple of years, and certainly never hitting more than five, six, or seven years. So youth was very much seen as a kind of passage to adulthood it wasn't really a stage of its own. There were youth movements like the Summer of Love or punk or disco, but those were seen as being at war with adult culture. There was also no internet, so there was no easy way to connect to every young person like you and share what you were all doing in common. So we always asked our young people the same question. What are you going to be when you grow up? Almost like what they were being now didn't matter. For millennials, it's different because it's the age of we, and the age of we is the age of now. Adolescence isn't a short period of time anymore. It can be 10, 12, even 15 years. You're no longer getting out of high school and all of a sudden automatically on the road to getting a job and having kids and getting married. You could have a very windy path that takes you in different directions. There is an internet that allows you to connect to every other young person like you, so you are able to celebrate those youthful moments. And as we've talked about, adults care more about what's happening with young people, so even they popularize some of these things. So we no longer actually ask our young people what they're going to be when they grow up. If you hop on Facebook, it actually says, what's on your mind? Twitter doesn't say, what's happening tomorrow? Twitter says, what's happening right now? Tell me and share it with everybody. I believe that all of life's mysteries can be solved through uh, teen movies. So I'm going to use examples of teen movies from a previous generation to this one just to really hammer home this point. Y'all have seen John Hughes movies? Uh, Sixteen Candles? Hands up, please. Uh, the Breakfast Club? Pretty in Pink? Ferris Bueller's Day Off? That just means you get the Superstation because they show it like seven times every weekend. So these movies all follow the exact same plot. It's the travails of being young. We follow our protagonist, usually played by Molly Ringwald. 
she has a crazy group of friends, but when there's finally a moment of emotional growth or connection, it happens in a moment alone or alone with just one other person. Here she is on that window with Jake Ryan finally having someone notice that it's her 16th birthday, removed from all the chaos that had surrounded her. These movies also have one other interesting thing in common. There is always this sense that growing up means there is massive change just around the corner and your life is going to be different. That actually happens a lot in the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where Ferris actually will turn to the camera and say, we're going to college next year and it's all going to be different. Here's an example. Oh, shit. I have to go. I'll call you tonight. So these are affluent kids living in Chicago who are 18 years old and they're talking about marriage throughout this entire movie. That would not happen anymore. Ferris reminds us and Cameron reminds us that everything will change next year. There's always the sense that adolescence is just about to end and that a whole new adult life is right around the corner. Compare that to a pretty charming movie from about five years ago called Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist. Anybody see this movie? It's the one where Michael Sarah plays an awkward kid. <laughs> so you're familiar with his oeuvre. That's great. So it follows the exact same plot lines as a John Hughes movie. We have uh, the travails of being young. We have our protagonist, this time played by the slightly more feminine than Molly Ringwald, Michael Sarah. We've got a... <laughs> Sorry. Well, he's not here to defend himself. It's awful. Uh, they've got a crazy group of friends. But this moment of personal growth or connection doesn't happen alone. It actually happens when you are still connected to your entire network. And there's not a sense that everything is going to change. In fact, this is just another night, no matter what kind of growing up has to happen. Here's a scene from that movie. I apologize. They're going to use a bad word or say something in a bad way. I love you. I love you. I love you so much, it's retarded. Mm. So are you going off to college? Um, it smells so good. I don't know, I got into brown. Into brown. Oh, you smell like soap. But I have this job lined up here. Which I really don't know. And I have to make up my mind fast because I'm only holding my spot at brown until tomorrow. I'm going to Berkeley School of Music. Oh, yeah? In Boston. That's awesome. If you went to Brown, you'd only be an hour away. Yeah. Oh. Mm, what's wrong? Cramp. What? What? Hold on. I, my hand's stuck in the seat. Cramp, 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 cramp. Oh. cramp. Oh. 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 So I love that clip for two reasons. One is, again, there's nothing that ever happens when you're removed from your group of people. You could be having a serious conversation in the front of a car, and your two friends could be macking it out in the back of the car, and that's just how it works. But more importantly, that's it. That's it for conversations about the future. I have to decide because they need my application by tomorrow. Let's go to a concert. Let's go have fun. There is no uh, sense that it's, it's going to all change, and there is no gap between something happening to you and your whole network finding out about it. So if it is always now and we are always connected, we start to share more and more with each other. We see other people sharing more and more with themselves and with each other, and we start to send information back more and more quickly. We start to relax maybe what our standards of privacy were. We, we start to use it in a more robust fashion. We end up always giving to the network and we end up always getting from the network. So the line between what is public and what is private is shrinking. The line between consumers of culture and makers of culture has pretty much ceased to exist. That's as good a time as any to talk about technologies. 93% of young people are online daily, 92% on a mobile phone, and three quarters of those are smartphones. Those last two numbers are very important because they far outpace the rest of the population. And so they are using these social networks to connect with each other and to share everything as it happens. When I started making this presentation a few years ago, I would talk almost exclusively about Facebook and Twitter, but obviously we've seen other networks rise. So I'm just gonna ask for a show of hands. Who's on Facebook? Who's never been on Facebook? Who thinks I'm speaking German when I say Facebook? <laughs> Who's on Facebook right now? <laughs> I just got to... Okay, good. I just had to update my status. Um, 
who's are on YouTube, as in who's broadcasting on YouTube from their own channel, and who's ever watched a video on YouTube. Okay, uh, Pinterest, anyone using Pinterest? Guys, any guys using Pinterest? <laughs> I'm gonna skip the next breakout session, the four of us are gonna talk, because, okay, that's good. Uh, Twitter, who's on Twitter? And um, who has never been on Twitter? And who thinks I'm stuttering when I say Twitter? <laughs> Anyone in the room who uses Twitter but never tweets, just uses it to curate information? Becoming more and more popular, 42% of people who are on Twitter never actually broadcast themselves, they just use it as a way to get info. And lastly, who is on Instagram? Who took a selfie today? <laughs> you people are the worst. Honest question, who made duck face when they took their selfie? <laughs> no, that's, that's the lower okay, that's one, one underneath. Or maybe tonight after there's been alcohol. All right. So 90, almost 94% of young Canadians are on Facebook. 42% are there multiple times a day. From women aged 18 to 35, one in three check Facebook or Instagram first thing in the morning. As in, I haven't gotten out of bed to pee yet, but I'm going to check Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> Uh, 92%, uh, 91% of this group have watched videos on YouTube. 18% are on Pinterest pinning. 36.6% tweet, 16%, that's one in six very often. And lastly, 40% are on Instagram. If you're not on these networks, you don't obviously need to be. I will say you have to understand them to understand this generation of young people. I'm not suggesting that you need to spend all of your time on them or that you need to um, have multiple accounts at multiple places and you certainly don't need to tweet what you had for lunch, but you do need to follow along. So my big recommendation is there is two things. One is, honestly, if you've never been on Facebook, you need to just hop on like Wikipedia and read about Facebook to understand the history and what it is. But I follow a website called Mashable, M-A-S-H-A-B-L-E.com. It's a um, social media and technology website with regular updates, and it will fill you in on the big trends that are happening um, with these different, different social media. It, it's really important to, to simply know, because I don't think you can understand young people without understanding them. Um, Twitter has become more and more important for young people. In fact, there are concerns before um, uh, it's about to launch its IPO. There are some concerns, actually, that uh, teens and uh, tweens especially are abandoning Facebook or not getting on it and instead using Twitter. So for those of you that aren't on Twitter, it's a social media uh, website like any other. Uh, you log on, you create an account, and you choose to follow people who can choose to follow you, and you update 140 characters at a time. It's really popular simply because it works incredibly well with a mobile device. You can instantly tell your network what you're doing from your phone very easily. It's not really bandwidth heavy. Uh, there are hundreds of millions of people on Twitter worldwide now, but it's interesting how much it's grown with this group of young people. And I want to say everybody's on Twitter, and by that I don't mean every person. I mean that people are on Twitter, but restaurants will get on Twitter to tell you about their specials, and every news outlet is on Twitter, and as they release a new article or a new piece of information, they will tweet out about it, and brands are on Twitter, and celebrities are on Twitter. I think Katy Perry just passed Justin Bieber to have the most followers on Twitter of any celebrity, so depending on whether or not you're uh, 13 or younger, uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> so remember some implications for your group in particular. Sharing is absolutely fundamental for young people. It is not just about communicating, it is about sharing. And social media, no matter what your age is, behaves youthfully. It is driven by young people. So being connected to a young person means connecting through technology more than ever before. Understanding where they want to connect is critical, but also understanding what it is they want to keep private. And Facebook is not the only social network. I actually have noticed a shift, particularly with some of my female friends, that Instagram has become their go-to social network because they just like to communicate visually and it's easier for them. Take a picture, talk about it, and send that to your network. If I come back in five years and make a presentation like this, we will be talking about three or four different social networks that have popped up since then. So this is a really good time to talk about culture and how culture works. We've talked about their demographics, their psychographics. We've talked about the technology and social media. Now let's talk about the culture that allows them to create and to connect and to communicate through. Because the big question for all of us fundamentally is how do we engage young people? 
you want to connect to them, you want to actually find a way to relate to them, that often happens through their culture. And that culture is changing quite quickly. It's a part I call culture in transition and the three C's. Change, charge, and challenge. Change coming from relentless change in culture. Putting young people in charge of their own lives in a way that's never happened before. Allowing them to challenge the status quo and make some changes that have an impact on all of us. Let's start first and foremost by talking about change. Because for the longest time, technology moved very, very slowly. Adults controlled youth culture, or at least the distribution of it, and that wasn't changing. But over the past 15 years, we've seen a faster speed of technological change, and this is having a huge impact on youth culture. So now, a huge speed of change is regular. Technological change creates cultural change. Prices have dropped on everything. And the bigger an organization you work with, the harder it can be to deal with this change. There were a series of TV ads just a few years ago that talked about how it was possible now to go out and get a really good $1,000 laptop. Kind of laugh at that for a couple of reasons. One is, anyone remember when a really good laptop was like four or $5,000? When home computers were at least five grand? When cell phones were these enormous devices that <laughs> looked like they were designed by the Russian army in 1945 and cost you 1,500 bucks? So this, five years ago, charged people with, can you find a great laptop for under $1,000? Of course, they all could. It was a TV ad. Now, you can find a decent machine if you want to for 500 bucks. It has democratized technology and put it in the hands of many of us, and it changes really quickly. It took a long while for us to go from having cell phones to texting with them, and a much shorter period of time for using them to send images, and a much shorter period of time after that to sending video. Every new technological change happens twice as quickly as the last one. This is probably the best example of change I can give you. This is a small, barely known con uh, consumer goods company called uh, Apple who made something called the iPod that one or two of you might have heard of. Anyone remember the first slogan for the very first iPod? It was, a thousand songs in your pocket. <laughs> a thousand songs is now a really crappy iPod because <laughs> Only a year and a half later, they came out with the iPod Mini, 1,500 songs, smaller in color. Then we had the first iPod Shuffle, 125, 250 songs, size of sort of a pack of gum. Then we had the first iPod Nano, thin as a pencil, color screen. Then the first iPod Video, which held 10,000 songs and played movies. We had the second iPod Shuffle released, which was about a third the size of the first one. The second iPod Nano lasted nine months. It was discontinued, and we had the third iPod Nano. And then finally, our first iPhones and our first iPod Touches. All of those were reinvented the year after they were released. All of those were reinvented again the year after that, and again after that, and again this year with the 5S and the 5C. It happened so quickly that this is what Tina Fey and Amy Poehler had to say about it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled about this. Introducing the new iPod Pequeño. <laughs> Just now. <laughs> the iPod Pequeño, the smallest iPod yet. It holds a million songs. A million songs. A million songs. It has an eye counter that goes... So they're obviously making fun, but the point is a good one. Who in the room is using the first cell phone they've ever had. I don't mean as a doorstop or a paperweight. I mean, who's <laughs> using it? Who's on their second? Who's on their third? I'm like, I'm like, who's on their second? It's like, young people, well, that makes sense. Okay. Who's on their third? Their fourth? Their fifth? Who honestly can't remember because you've had so many damn cell phones? <laughs> so again, when they first came out, they were huge and expensive, and you just have the one. I remember I got my first phone in probably 1997 or so, and as I was leaving the Rogers store, I thought to myself, oh, good, I am done. I have one of these. I'm, I'm finished. Not realizing, of course, that it would be obsolete by the time I actually left the mall. <laughs> so that level of change is important, but also, who bought an iPod when they first came out? Remember what you paid for it? $600, $700? And it was... 10 gigs with a black and white screen. Now, a 64 gig iPod Touch, which is 1,000 times the computer that first device was, is three or $400. dollars. 
it's not just that there's this speed of change. It is that the prices on this technology drops, and that's the reason why, as you've seen, 75% of young Canadians have a smartphone. It's because you can get an iPhone 3C for $99. All right, so change leads us to charge. Because for the longest time, there was very little personal control or choice over communication and culture. The internet and digital culture has now changed everything, though. It's a world of culture on demand and a world of, of communication on demand. So now, there is a seemingly infinite choice of what to consume and when and how to connect. And more importantly, there's been a control shift from creators to consumers and from adults to youth. There are tons of amazing examples of how this has happened, but nothing is probably a better example of this than music. So who in the room used Napster? I'm not a police officer, so who in the room used Napster? <laughs> so you all remember when Napster came out and it completely changed the way we all interacted with music. It was an unbelievable feeling, not really because it was free, although free is nice, but because all of a sudden the device you use the most often, your computer, opened you up to every song that was out there. The uh, recording industry obviously hated this. They have made their entire uh, life's work on selling you music in formats that they wanted to and not that you wanted to. So they tried to shut Napster down and they did. And what happened? A half dozen alternatives popped up the next day. Who used Kazaa? Audio Galaxy. LimeWire. Oh, you Apple cultists, I love you guys. Uh, <laughs> Who's been paying for their music on iTunes? Oh, wow, I've heard of you guys. I've just <laughs> never seen so many in one room at the same time. It blows my mind that the number one retailer of music on the planet didn't sell their first song until 2003. Apple has always been very good at not only giving customers what they wanted, but anticipating what the next thing is that they wanted. The recording industry said, you will buy CDs when I want you to buy them. And Apple said, you can buy individual tracks when you want to buy them right to your machine. And Apple won. Interestingly enough, they've stumbled lately. So who's using a streaming music service like RDO or Songza? So again, if I come back in a couple of years, it'll be twice or three times as many hands. We're actually moving to a world where we don't need to own a physical or digital copy of the songs that we want to hear. You can simply pay a service, $10, $20 a month, and have access to their entire library when you want it. We're already kind of doing this with non-music elements. Who uses Netflix? More people than are doing this for music. That will change. Who actually goes out and buys DVDs? That number is shrinking with every passing day because you can have access to every movie or TV show you want and stream it without actually having to own it. Anyone in the room using Netflix and pretending to be from the US when they use it? So um, the Canadian, because of rights issues, the Canadian Netflix library is about 1 20th the size of the US Netflix library. But if you want to, you could uh, download and install for $50 a year with unlimited data something like Tunnel Bear, that's T-U-N-N-E-L-B-E-A-R. <laughs> and it allows you to pretend that you're uh, surfing the internet from another country like the US or the UK and have access to all of that. Again, these have all been developed by young people who are taking charge of the way that they connect to the people around them and the culture in their lives. And big brands are having to pay attention or they're falling by the wayside. So charge lastly leads us to challenge. Because again, for the longest time, everything was very, very top down. Uh, there was a kind of adult machine that created culture and young people had to sort of deal with it on their terms. As we've just shown, now young people are having an impact on what trends happen, how uh, uh, adult culture works, how the corporate machine creates the things that we want to connect to or that we want to buy. So now young people are actually creating the culture they consume or even inventing the mechanisms that lets them create their own culture and they're sending it out into the world and we're all using it. We've all done this as young people for a long time. We've looked at the brands that we like or the things that we like and we've appropriated it for ourselves and we've not cared about the law, we've not cared about copyright. One of the customary things you do as a young person is when you like something, you try to share it. What's the best kids brand of all time? You just like tiny overalls. What's the, uh, no, kidding. Um, I gotta say it's Disney in that these guys have been doing what they've been doing for 80 years really successfully, but they've been doing it by holding on to these characters that they have. Not surprisingly, Disney has the most 
angry group of trademark lawyers in the entire country, and their job is to make sure that you do not recreate Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck without paying them a hefty licensing fee. Except, of course, our kids have been doing this, and parents have been aiding and abetting this heinous crime, <laughs> but it just looks like this. <laughs> we have always wanted, as young people, to take the culture that we like, reappropriate for ourselves, and send it out into the world. So young people are now doing that, either with mechanisms someone else has invented or mechanisms they'll invent themselves. About six years ago, there was a digital short on Saturday Night Live called Lazy Sunday. Anybody see this one? It's Chris Parnell and Andy Samberg rapping about going to see the movie The Chronicles of Narnia. It's much funnier than I'm making it sound. Okay. Um, so this appeared about six years ago, and something like five million people watched it on SNL that week. One of them took a digital copy and uploaded it to a six-month-old website called YouTube, where six million people watched it. So just to be really clear, a 100-year-old or 80-year-old TV network with a 35-year-old TV show was able to get this out to 5 million people. Some kid in a dorm room somewhere using a six-month-old website that he didn't even own was able to get this out to 6 million people. So it went out there, was popular. What do you think NBC did at that point? Yeah, they sued a lawsuit, of course. When you're a broadcaster, you don't want people seeing your content. That's the worst. So YouTube took it down, and six other copies went up. NBC realized, actually, that because of the development of different search engines and different social media and networks and different ways to share video, it was impossible for them to prevent this from happening. This was going to be shared somewhere, somehow. So the next year, they had an even more popular digital short, this one called Dick in a Box. <laughs> Anybody see this one? Who saw it on TV? Who saw it online? That's because NBC sent a pristine, uncensored digital copy to YouTube, and 65 million people watched it in the first month. Twelve times as many saw it on TV. They recognized that they couldn't prevent this from getting out there, so they had to rethink their entire strategy for how they were going to distribute their content. And I would argue that the Saturday Night Live brand has become completely reinvigorated by these digital shorts that they release not through TV. This one was so popular that year that it was actually my Halloween costume. <laughs> so that's nice for all of us. Okay, then. So there's some implications from all of this. Remember that changing technology means changing habits. Remember that for young people, especially mobile, is where all of this starts. There is a $99 iPhone available out there right now. There are lots of $0 phones. And what I think is important for you guys is it's not unlike being a teacher in a classroom uh, dealing with blended learning now. Different technologies means a different ability to reach more young people. I'm actually fairly passionate about this. Um, less so, uh, well, I'll sort of tell a quick story. But um, for me, what I love and why I get very passionate about technology, especially when technology is available for as many people as possible, is I think we all learn or communicate or connect in a different fashion. And we tend to do things in one size fits all. This is a good example of that. Some people learn, this is, this is a lyceum. This is a 2,000 year old piece of te teaching technology I'm using. It's an auditorium to speak to people. And some people learn very well this way, but some people don't. Some people connect very well face to face, one on one, and some people are shyer and need to reach out in a different way. Some people need to write everything down, some people don't. So I get very excited about technology because I think it opens up new ways of connecting with people. And it's a very interesting time right now because, well, who in the room um, has a kid or a, or a, or a niece or nephew or a, or a grandkid who's three or under? Have you watched them use a touch screen? The most mind-blowing thing in the world is to watch a two-year-old use a touch screen. If you have kids of your own or grandkids and you get nervous about this, there was a wonderful article in Atlantic Monthly a couple months ago about kids and touch screens. You can find it online at their website. It's truly extraordinary. Um, and essentially, what it said was, too much of anything is bad. And obviously, if what your kid is doing is spending eight hours a day on an iPad playing games, that's not great. But if they're learning or using it or connecting to their world, it can actually be amazing for them. At the Toronto Zoo right now, we have chimpanzees with iPads. And you can go on YouTube and you can find a really good video of dolphins using iPads. 
There is something about mammals and touch screens and the way it allows us to connect to a world that is just this thing that we're now discovering. So where touch screen technology gets very inexpensive, I get excited not because it should dominate our world, but because it does open up a whole new path for people who may not have been as great at this kind of connecting or this kind of communicating. It just, it's another channel. It shouldn't be the only one, but it can really help a large group of people. And so barriers are dropping. It's maybe the most important thing I can leave you with, that the barriers between our work lives and our school lives and our home lives and our social lives and our commercial lives and our media lives, they are all dropping. And for young people in particular who have never really understood these barriers to begin with, this is important. For connecting with them, it's incredibly important. <coughs> Excuse me. It all comes through that one same device, and your whole network life comes to the same place. And that I choose to represent with Facebook. So that's an example of my Facebook page. But everybody is on Facebook. And by that I mean every single category of person or organization is on Facebook. Brands are on Facebook. Starbucks, not surprisingly, has millions and millions of followers on their Facebook page. However, there are also like 30 I hate Starbucks Facebook groups out there as well. <laughs> and one of the things they've had to learn to deal with in keeping open, transparent communication is someone will post on their wall that they hate Starbucks. They'll announce a new single origin coffee has come out and someone will say, here's what actually is happening with that farmer, for instance. You just have to deal with this because it's all come together. We're seeing Facebook at home. This is a good example. It's going to be a little hard to read, but has anyone ever been on a, a website called Lamebook? So Lamebook is the best of the worst of Facebook. I should warn you, if you spend any time, like go there and just give up an afternoon. It just sucks you in for an entire afternoon. <laughs> so here's a good example from Lamebook. This is, um, well, it was a brother and sister, and they lived at home together. They're teenagers. Um, and they had fairly strict parents. So she went into his room and found some beer that he had hidden and ratted him out to mom and dad. So he went into her room and found something called her hookup list. <laughs> and this was a list of all the guys at school she either wanted to get with or the one or two that she had gotten with. He scanned it, he uploaded it, and he tagged every one of those guys. <laughs> so the comments below are, devastating and hilarious at exactly the same time. This happened when we were all younger. Initially, it was people writing on bathroom walls, and then it was, uh, you know, photocopied sheets of paper posted up around school. Now it's just been weaponized because of the internet, where it all comes together. Um, there's some bad words in this next one, but here's a girl uh, from the UK who updated her Facebook status to say, oh my God, I hate my job. My boss is a total pervy wanker, always making me do stuff just to piss me off. Wanker. So first of all, just a moment for the King's English, because it's lovely, isn't it? He writes a couple of things, but then he says, that stuff is called, oh, sorry, he, he, he writes underneath, I guess you forgot about adding me on here. This is her boss, who she added as a Facebook friend, and then said some pretty bad things about. And he said, that stuff is called your job, you know, what I pay you to do. But the fact that you seem to be able to mess up even the simplest of tasks might contribute to how you feel about it. And lastly, you also seem to have forgotten that you have two weeks left on your six-month trial period. Don't bother coming in tomorrow. I'll pop your pink slip in the mail, and you can pick it up whenever you, your stuff up whenever you'd like. And yes, I'm serious. So what I mean by everything coming together is, if you've added your boss as a Facebook friend, you probably shouldn't be trashing your boss or your workplace. We are going to see many more examples of this. Um, specifically, so far, a burgeoning trend <clears throat> is young people, new employees, being unable to get the time off work that they want to, to go do something fun, faking sick, and then not realizing that whenever you go do something fun, there are a million photos of you doing that fun thing, <laughs> and that even if you haven't added your boss on, it's a small world now. And so if you haven't reset your privacy settings, for friends of a friend, you're going to show up in someone else's feed. Even if you haven't been tagged in a photo, someone may recognize you when you were in a photo somebody else uploaded that your face is still in. One of the big changes happening in Facebook right now that I want to talk about really briefly is facial recognition technology, where already, you remember when you used to upload photos, it would just have people in the photo and it would say, and you would have to tag them yourself. Now there's a little square that seems to go around somebody's head and it says, who is this? 
within a couple of years, that square will say, is this Max? Because it's going to recognize my face. Or is it Fred Savage, depending on how good the software is. <laughs> Full circle comedy, everybody. That's what you get with me as a speaker. Um, but it's something we all have to think about. Uh, there was a wonderful thing that got posted around Facebook a little while ago, which I read, about um, kids and young, really young people already having a social footprint uh, in social media, already having a digital footprint because their parents are uploading photos of them. And so what happens when the facial recognition technology starts to understand who this kid is and builds a whole timeline for them before maybe they've built their own identity? These are things that we have to think about because Facebook is everywhere. It's even at church. This says, you have one new friend request from Jesus, confirm or ignore. <laughs> I actually think you're supposed to deny him three times, but and it's I, <laughs> biblical humor, that's right, all right. So before we end, I just want to say that it's not all exclusively Facebook and Twitter as social networks. Those two grew by 11 and 62 percent last year. But Foursquare, Instagram, and Pinterest grew much faster than that. Foursquare is a social network that uses location-based services to find out where you are and then allows you to tell your network that you're there by checking into a location. Uh, Bars, restaurants, retail shops like it because if you announce to your network that, they're th that you're there, they'll give you some kind of a discount or bonus or special. Instagram is a massively growing network that allows people to simply take a photo and share it right from their mobile device. Facebook paid one billion dollars for it a few years ago, or, or just last year, sorry, because it's been growing so quickly and it seems to be so popular. And then Pinterest is like an online pin board. It's a social network that allows you to simply go to other websites, find pictures that you like, and attach them to pin boards for inspiration if you want. So let's say you are getting married or redoing your house. You can go online, you can find images, and you can uh, collect them into different boards and then share them with people. It's interesting that some of the really quickly growing networks are those that have a heavy visual element embedded into them already. And I think that's as much an indication of how much better our phones are getting and how much better our Wi-Fi and how much more connected we are. There's a lot of brands that use these. I want to just briefly focus on Instagram and two brands. It's going to seem kind of weird. Ben and & Jerry's and General Electric are both on Instagram. And they're both pretty cool. They haven't paid anything to be there. They haven't paid anything to get fans on either of those. Ben & Jerry's has about 100,000, GE 200,000, I think. And they don't spend any money on marketing. They don't use this for sales. They simply use these to build what their brand is about. Ben & Jerry's Instagram feed is kind of a very lovely ode to living and working in Vermont, which is what they sh share pictures of. It's not directly selling ice cream, but it's reminding people what they're about. GE does something very similar. It's General Electric. They have access to ridiculously amazing photo opportunities of huge pieces of industrial machinery. And so they take photos of stuff like that and share that out with their network. Again, they're not spending any money on it and they're not trying directly to sell something, but it's a good example that social networks can be used to, to, to build brands. Um, oops, here we go. Uh, and in fact, I think that matters for everyone in this room because all of your organizations are brands. We talk a lot about the one-to-one -one relationship between a mentor and a mentee, and I think that that is incredibly important. But I will say that having a presence for whatever organization you're working for or working with in a social space is going to be increasingly important as well. Um, I think it's also important to remember that you're therefore competing against every other brand that's out there. So you don't want to be over-posting, you don't want to be boring, you want to be interesting, you want to do something that people will connect to. And it's going to be a challenge for everyone here at every different organization that you're at, but it's important to, to, to have your brand out there. And remember that brands live in that very important space where people are literally taking you in on the device that matters the most to them, and you're connected to their whole network. So it validates everything that you do. So to end, I want to say this. I think that it is a time of great change and an awful lot going on in the lives of our young people. And to me, I think that means that you guys have never been as important to the development of a young person as you are right now. This era of relentless change means that so much more help is needed. So it's about helping to create an orientation towards this changing world and an ability to deal with what's next based on an understanding of what's happening now. But we have to remember, young people have 
redefine the music store and the search tool and the social network. They've had the Walkman and the television and the credit card redefined for them because they want it. So I'm going to ask, leave you with this, this final question of what's next for our mentoring system. And that is, will it change or will it be changed? And that's it for me. Thank you very much. We've got a couple of minutes if anybody has a, a question that they, they want to ask right away. Oh, there we go. Now, there are mics, or you can try hollering and we'll repeat the question. Can you hear me? Yep. So it's a great question about the gap between online, the online world and the natural world, and is, there, is, is the gap growing? Is the divide getting bigger? Um, so I've been, uh, this really isn't planned, and I'm going to answer your question in a, in, a, in, a, in a roundabout fashion, if I may. OK, so um, I've been writing a new trend, which uh, I haven't totally finished yet, but I'm going to share with you guys now anyway. OK. And really, it's about to come up on the screen. I'm not kidding. I was just writing this, and I have it at the end of this presentation, so we're going to go into this. Because um, we have a couple minutes. Yeah, it's okay? Yeah, yeah okay. So um, I think for the past 10 or 12 years or so, maybe even 15 years, it's been all about turning everything digital. Digital, digital. And this, there's going to be more marketing implications here, but I'm going to come back to your question just because I think this will help to answer it. So. Um, I think we got so excited about making everything digital that we stopped focusing on the non-digital, the non-online stuff. Here's a commercial from Sony from about 15 years ago that talks about our previous orientation towards being digital. I'm just going to play this. You know, people can be so cruel. I got feelings like everybody else. So what if I can't hook up a stereo? Or I don't know the difference between high fidelity and digital cinema sound? Does that make me inferior? Your analog! I'm gonna beat him at their own game. I don't know how, but I'll find a way. So, when the internet was nascent and we were all taking it on, and again, the price of technology was dropping, all those things started to happen. Our focus was exclusively on let's make everything we possibly can digital. Let's get digital versions of anything. And we mocked people who weren't somehow digital. I think right now we're starting to see a bit of a, not a backlash to it, but a reaction to that relentless digital culture in this growth and development of what I'm calling analog culture, which is hopefully going to get back to answering your question. It's not anti-digital. It's a reaction that we can live in a world that is a combination of digital and analog, and that anything that is just digital is providing us not the full experience that we want to. I think people are looking for more human experiences. I think they're looking for some non-digital stuff. And I also think that it's, it's difficult to give us something sort of brand new and digital now that we understand it so well that we've integrated it into so much of our lives. Um, so to me, I think there's actually a great opportunity to have these two things come together, the digital and the analog, as it were. Not always exclusively in nature, I don't want to say. Uh, part of it is working with that natural world, but part of it is also more warm human experiences that I think people are looking for more. Um, it's what I'm actually calling a kind of rehumanization, that when we want something that's tactile and real and not compromising, we can't just get it out of our digital experiences anymore. I'm going to use a couple of weird examples and then come back. So you all use those um, Moleskine notebooks. People love those notebooks. But I use Evernote to take notes, which is a note-taking app. And I love it because in Evernote, a note can be a voice note or a picture or something that I type. And it shares it with my iPad, my iPhone, my desktop, all that stuff. And I can clip stuff from the web. Well, amazingly, these guys have developed a notebook 
that works with Evernote, where the pages are actually designed in such a way that they're easier to take photos of, and you can actually draw a tag, and it'll automatically file it for you correctly. That's digital and analog coming together, and I see a huge growth of that. Um, this is a great example. This chart shows you the growth of vinyl album sales over the past 20 years. Where again, in the early 90s, it was all about, I don't want records, give me CDs, because I, I want to get my whole collection there. And then, uh, in the last decade, in the aughts, uh, it became, I want uh, everything I have to be available on my iPod or my iPhone. And so we all do that now. Everyone can have access to every song they want digitally. We don't have to focus on that. So people have instead said, well, look, analog music sounds better. Our ears are analog. Your speakers or your earphones convert digital tracks back into something analog. And records provide a warmer, richer sound for that. So yeah, I have my iPod and I have every song ever. But also connected to my speaker at home is a record player for better sounding music. Um, it's obviously uh, the kind of thing that's happening more with you know, rock and classic rock than any other genre, but I am seeing this grow. And as you can see, we hit a, uh, the, the highest number of vinyl records sold in 25 years in the last year. So there is that kind of growth. I'm also seeing it a bit in artisanal or handmade culture where um, you know, sites like Etsy are doing incredibly well because they're allowing people to buy a handmade good, but you can only do it if you've got access to that person through the internet. By the way, if you're ever on Etsy, it's amazing, but you should check out a site called Regretsy, uh, which has <laughs> the worst purchases people have ever made on Etsy. Um, a French telecom company, actually, uh, when you signed up with them, they um, gave you, as, uh, for signing up with them, they gave you a Facebook meaning they created code that went into your Facebook page and actually gave you a glossy paged hardback book of everything that was happening to you on Facebook. It was a hugely popular promotion because again, it's digital and analog. Um, I have one other interesting example that just came up. Um, a Canadian example actually. Have any of you guys seen the Budweiser red light? So there's nothing more analog than when you're at a hockey game and your team scores and that red goal light goes off and everybody goes insane. So Budweiser actually did something where you could order a red light just like it, install it wherever you watch TV, hook it up to your Wi-Fi, and when you're watching a hockey game and your team scores, the light will actually go off in your house. <laughs> 150 bucks it was. It wasn't free, and they sold out. And to me, that's a good example of a digital and an analog experience coming together. So... It's a long-winded way of answering your question, but I was so excited because I'm working on this and somebody asked this, so this is what we're, doing. We're, we're growing together. Um, I, I think the important thing to say is this. It's not digital or nature. It's digital and nature. And it's not just nature. It's that whole group of, of tactile, real, warm, analog experiences that can't be replicated through digital. I think the big mistake, if you want a young person to get heavily interested in that, and who can look at that and not get heavily interested, the big mistake is to say, um, I don't want you taking pictures of this on your phone when you're, out, when you're out there. It's like, take pictures of this on your phone and also live in this moment and enjoy it at the same time. And I think those things coming together is how, ideally, it's going to be the best possible result for our young people, building those two together and seeing that there's already a demand for this real, warm, human stuff. And I think that there's, there's a great opportunity to bridge the two. Thank you. If anyone else has a question, it won't be that kind of an answer. <laughs> I, think, I, I think that's it. Okay, think thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks everybody. Mark. Thank you. <laughs>I have to say, I did beg the question as to, uh, you know, that's an unbelievable preparation when the first question out of the audience has six slides ready to go. A um, little bit of clairvoyance there. Uh, you know, it's funny, you go, to, you go to a lot of these conferences and, and sessions, and for me, it's always what, what's kind of the takeaway. I, I mean, I guess for me right now, there's a few. There is a, I'm a, a proud dad of three teenage daughters, and now I might actually have some insights and understandings as to what's going on at home. Because um, there's days I really don't quite get it. Um, but, you know, you think about it for organizations, and just a, a Big Brothers Big Sisters example. Uh, we know from our national database system that the average age of a volunteer at the time they inquire is uh, that 75% of our volunteers at that time are under the age of 30. So we're a 100-year-old organization, but our critical mass of both the young people who are receiving and benefiting from the service and those who are the primary delivery system of the service are all under 30. 
And so what does that mean for us as an organization in order to communicate with, attract, recruit, train, all of those kinds of things? The other question that it, it often leads us to ask is that quite often there's a belief that a mentoring relationship is this much older trusted kind of guide. They're not that much older. And so what does that mean for us in, in how we prepare our mentors uh, to be able to deal with situations or issues? The kind of ways that we're communicating with them as we think about wanting to have long-term, consistent, strong matches to be able to provide an impact for young people. But some of these don't have very much life experience themselves if you, if you, you think about the prolonged adolescence. And so the, it raises questions. And I think those are always good things when you go to sessions like this. And you, you think about information that we've been presented with and how can it impact our, our daily lives in the work. So once again, a round of applause for Max Valakat. Thanks very much.